God is with you. God is with you indeed. Thanks be to all that is holy. Welcome to worship on this beautiful day. Wow, who knew way back when the lockdown began that our, our summer worship was going to still look like this from my home to your home. The good news is that each week, more and more of you are joining us as we worship together online. Welcome, whether you have been worshiping with us for years and years, or whether you just happened upon this worship opportunity via social media. Everyone is welcome to worship with us. So let's take a few deep breaths to prepare ourselves to worship. As always, we worship as we live in the midst of the one who is our Creator Christ and Spirit One. Amen. The grace of our risen Sophia Christ, the love which is El Shaddai, the Breasted One, and the power of Ruach the Spirit is with us all. Thanks be to all that is holy.
Let us pray. Let us open ourselves to the power of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Let us breathe deeply of the one who lives and breathes in, with, through, and beyond us. Let us embody this love we call God, who is beyond the beyond and beyond that also, and yet who takes delight in us. All praise and honor be to the one our ancestors called El Shaddai, Chokhmah, Ruach, and we know as our Creator, Christ, and Spirit One. Amen. You made this world, you made this world, you made this world, thank you, thank you. You gave me life, you gave me life, you gave me life, thank you, thank you. this peace you brought this peace you brought this peace you sow these seeds you sow these seeds you sow these seeds thank you you love is everywhere you love is everywhere
the Holy Gospel as it is recorded in Matthew. Jesus said, What comparison can I make with this generation? They are like children shouting to others as they sit in the marketplace. We piped you a tune, but you would not dance. We sang you a dirge, but you would not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he is possessed. The chosen one comes eating and drinking, and they say, this one is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wisdom will be vindicated by her actions. Wisdom will be vindicated by her deeds. Then Jesus prayed, Abba God, creator of heaven and earth, to you I offer praise for what you have hidden from the learned and the clever you have revealed to the youngest children. Yes, Abba, everything is as you want it to be. Jesus continued, Everything has been handed over to me by Abba God. No one comes to the only begotten except Abba God, and no one knows Abba God except the only begotten, and those to whom the only begotten wants to give that revelation. Come to me, all you who labor and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon your shoulders and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. Here you will find the rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' words, we can hear the dim echoes of a time gone by. Long before Jesus came, there was a character who called out in the marketplaces. You could read about her in the biblical books of Proverbs, Job, the Wisdom of Solomon, and Ecclesiasticus. What students of the Bible call the wisdom literature is, is full of stories about a character who so many people have never heard of. In the book of Proverbs, she claims to have been there when the Creator was busy creating, and she declares, When God set the heavens in place, I was present. When God drew a ring on the surface of the deep, when God fixed the clouds above, when God fixed fast the wells of the deep, when God assigned the sea its limits, when God established the foundations of the earth, I was by God's side, a master craftswoman, delighting day after day, ever at play by God's side, at play everywhere in God's domain, delighting to be with the children of humanity. So just who is this master craftswoman? Job insists that we have heard reports of her, but God alone has traced her path and found out where she lives. The writer of Ecclesiasticus admonishes the reader to court her with all your soul and with all your might, keep her ways, go after her and seek her. She will reveal herself to you. Once you hold her, do not let her go. For in the end, you will find rest in her and she will take the form of joy for you. In the wisdom of Solomon, she is described as quicker to move than any motion. She is so pure, she pervades and permeates all things. She is a breath of the power of God, pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Hence, nothing impure can find a way into her. She is a reflection of the eternal light, untarnished mirror of God's active power, image of God's goodness. Although alone she can do all things herself unchanging, she makes all things new. In each generation she passes into holy souls. She makes them friends of God and prophets. You may not know who she is, but Jesus certainly did. Tales of her deeds were popular in Jesus' day. 
Jesus, a student of the scriptures who was referred to as a rabbi, would certainly have known who this heroine of the scriptures is. In the ancient Hebrew texts of the wisdom literature, she is called by the name Hochma. In the ancient Greek translations of these Hebrew texts, she is called Sophia. In our English translations of these texts, she is simply known as Wisdom. The ancient Hebrew and Greek languages were written without punctuation, and often in Greek there were no spaces between the words. Until long after Jesus' day, there were only capital letters. Upper and lower case letters were, were not used. Unlike our system, where personal names begin with a capital and are followed with lowercase letters, ancient texts consist of lines of unbroken capitals. Often ancient Greek, the words did not have spaces between them. And so translating these texts into English is tricky. This is just one of the reasons why Sophia's story has remained hidden from most of us. When you read the texts that describe wisdom, it is clear that they are at the very least speaking about wisdom as though wisdom is a person. Sophia is wisdom personified. Sophia is spoken of as being around from the very beginning, before creation itself. She was with Yahweh at the time of creation. Creation couldn't happen without her presence. Other biblical passages show her coming to be with, the, with humanity, reaching out to people, to be in relationship with them. She walks through the streets, calling out to people, trying to get them to listen to her, to follow her. She's also a welcoming hostess, inviting people to her table, a bountiful provider of food, the source of all good things. She is the way to abundant life. She's also a trickster, and play is one of the ways she gets things done. You may not have heard of her, but when Jesus speaks to people about children calling to one another in the marketplaces, the people would have remembered Sophia standing in the marketplaces and calling to the people, calling to them to come out and dance. But the people refused to join in Sophia's playful dance. You see, Sophia's reputation for playfulness led the people to refuse her invitation in the same way Jesus, who came eating and drinking, called out to the people, and his reputation led people to label him as a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus declares, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. Jesus hearkens back to the images in the memories of his people, images of Sophia in the scriptures. And Jesus insists that Sophia wisdom will be vindicated by her deeds. Sophia's reputation as a trickster who accomplishes great deeds through play and Jesus' reputation as a glutton and a drunkard who comes to the world eating and drinking aren't usually emphasized these days by those who tout their religion in the public square or on social media. I can honestly say that I have never heard people who call themselves Bible-believing Christians taking to social media to encourage friends and followers to eat, drink, and be merry. And yet this stuff is in the Bible. The Bible describes playfulness as an important part of the God in whose image we are created. All too often, those of us who profess to follow Jesus refuse to hear Jesus cry. We piped a tune, but you wouldn't dance. Jesus is calling us out to play. Yes, I know this is a summer like no other. 
No time in our lives has been like these times. And I would love to just go out to the lake and splash and play about in the water, but our beaches remain closed. So let Jesus' words take us back to the words of Sophia so that we can play together in the words of the scriptures. In the Bible, it is Sophia who is first given the task of calling God's people out to play. And that playfulness goes way beyond dancing. Despite the church's history of attempts to contain and or constrain our playfulness, Jesus continues in the tradition of Sophia to call us out to play. On this glorious summer day, on a weekend when it is meet right and salutary to celebrate, we can listen to the tune Jesus is piping and we can dance for joy for we are wondrously and gloriously made. Weekends are not the only thing designed for play. We are designed for play. In the biblical books, which are known as wisdom literature, it is made very clear that our bodies are blessings given by God so that we might delight in them. Playfulness includes exploring the pleasures that one body can give to another body. There's a little book in the Bible which we call the Song of Solomon, which for centuries was simply known as the Song of Songs. And there you will find words that can make self-righteous Christians blush and tell evangelists positively apoplectic. Look, there my love stands behind our wall, gazing at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Come away, for now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. Let my love kiss me with kisses on the mouth. How did this get in the Bible? The Song of Solomon, or as it's more commonly known, the Song of Songs, is surely the most erotic book in the Bible. This erotic Song of Songs is a long poem in which a woman, a black and beautiful woman, and a man, radiant and ruddy, speak the language of desire, cataloging every inch of each other's body, every smell and every taste of each other's body. The radiant young man declares to his lover, your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. And she tells anyone who will listen that his cheeks are like beds of spices yielding fragrance. His lips are lilies distilling liquid myrrh. He responds by claiming that her two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. I am my beloved's, she exalts, and his desire is for me. The Song of Songs is a song about desire. And so it is also a song about the pain of separation, of missed meetings, and of absence. Oh, that his left hand were under my head, the woman sings with palpable yearning, and that his right hand embraced me. When this passionate woman's lover knocks on her door, she hesitates for a moment to open it. And when she begins to speak, this ancient biblical woman speaks some of the sexiest lines in any literature. My beloved thrust his hand into the opening and my inmost being yearned for him. I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh upon the handles of the bolt. When she opens the door, he's gone. And she heads out into the city to search for him, crying, I implore you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell him this, I am faint with love. How did this erotic poem make it into the Bible? 
No one knows for sure, but scores of interpreters, both Jewish and Christian, have found in it the song of human yearning for the Divine One and the Divine One's desire to be in intimate relationship with humanity. The Song of Songs is read at the festival of Passover as a reminder that Yahweh delivered Israel from slavery, not because the Divine One was bound by the covenant to do so, but also because the Holy One loved the people of Israel and desired goodness for them. The ancient Christian writer Bernard of Clairvaux wrote more than 80 sermons on the Song of Songs without even making it past the third chapter. According to Clairvaux, the poem provided a means by which the individual believer could come into intimate relationship with God. Like all great poetry, the Song of Songs can easily sustain a wide range of interpretations, but it resists being read only as a spiritual text about human beings devoid of bodies. Clairvaux warned young monks and nuns not to read it until their faith matured because of the sexual feelings that this love, this desire poem is able to inspire in people. The song is so erotic that to this day, Orthodox Jews are cautioned not to read it until they reach the age of 40. For to read the song of songs without the wisdom that comes from age could cause the reader to unwisely give in to their own passionate desires. From the pages of scripture, sacred to Jews and Christians alike, the Song of Songs remains a testimony to, the mutual, to mutuality in love, to the beauty of the human body, to the goodness, the goodness of sexual desire and the power of love. The song proclaims that love is as strong as death and passion, passion is as fierce as the grave. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If one offered for love all the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned. And we're not talking about agape here. This is not the agape love shared between friends or members of a faith community. We're talking about eros. Eros, the love that is expressed in the passionate embrace of bodies. In the Song of Songs, we find no anxiety about erotic desire's power. In the Song of Songs, passionate desire is portrayed as the force which binds us to one another. The relationship described in the song is one of mutuality. The lovers are evenly matched in the force of their desire. They are equally vulnerable in their desire to be desired by one another. They are equally determined to give and to receive pleasure from one another. For centuries, the church has selected particular pieces of scripture in order to say no, no to the pleasures of sex in any way, shape, or form. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus declared that wisdom, Sophia, will be vindicated by wise deeds. Surely wisdom, Sophia, is vindicated in the relationships that are so intimate and satisfying that they draw us out of ourselves and more deeply into the passions of life in creation. Relationships in which pleasure is given and pleasure is received with joy. Relationships in which knowledge of the body is sought with care and gentleness, in which the body is pronounced beautiful over and over again. As we come to experience the erotic as sacred, we can begin to know ourselves as holy and to imagine ourselves sharing in creation with one another for our common well-being. When we recognize the face of the Holy One in the face of our lover, as well as in our own face, we can begin to feel at ease with our bodies. The Divine One moves among us 
in, with, through, and beyond our bodies. The Divine One lives and breathes and plays. Jesus implores us, come to me, all that you are, who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In these strange times, we may not be able to enjoy our regular summer pleasures. So as our beaches remain closed, why not open up the Song of Solomon and rejoice and be glad as you read, I am my beloved's and my beloved's desire is for me. Come my beloved, let us go forth into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early into the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. Then I will give you my love. According to the scriptures, Sophia stood out in the streets and invited the people to come out, to come out and play, to tell jokes, to laugh at our blunders. In today's gospel, Jesus compares his generation to children who sit and refuse to play. Do not let it be said of this generation that we refuse to play, that the delights and pleasures which come to us as gifts from our Creator were shunned or wasted. Our bodies are sacred instruments designed to be played. In the sacred dance of desire, we are opened to the transforming power of love. So remember to give and to take delight in your play. Let yourselves be transformed. Let your bodies open you to the wonders of life. And for God's sake, dance. Dance and rejoice, for you are wonderfully made, designed to play. Amen.
invite you to join in an interpretation of the prayer which Jesus taught. Let us pray. Lover of us all, most holy one, help us to respond to you, to create what you want for us here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs. Forgive our weak and deliberate offenses, just as we must forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good, for we are yours, endowed with your power to make the world whole. All praise and honor is yours forever. Amen. Our bodies are sacred instruments designed to play. In the sacred dance of desire, we are open to the transforming power of love. So remember to give and to take delight in your play. Let yourselves be transformed. Let your bodies open you to the wonders of life. And for God's sake, dance. Dance and rejoice for you are wonderfully made, designed to play. Play in the midst of the one who is our lover, beloved, and love herself. Amen. So, time for the announcements. As always, 
a big thank you to Marnie for your music. Marnie, it was wonderful. It always keeps us grounded as we try to navigate these strange times. So thank you, Marnie. It's difficult to believe that this is the first Sunday of July. I hope that you are staying safe and are faring well. Traditionally, things wind down for us during the summer as many of us go away on vacation. But this is not your average summer. This summer, we will continue to worship online. Our worship video will be posted at 1045 each Sunday morning, and you can view them anytime after that. Um, our treasurer, Sharon Smith, has made it easier for you to donate. In addition to making uh, mailing in checks or using Canada Helps, you can now send e-transfers. Uh, the email will be on the screen somewhere. If you have any questions, please contact Sharon. This summer, I am planning to stagger my vacation time so that I can continue to create worship videos for each Sunday. I will be working one week on and one week off, which means that on the weeks which I am working, I will create two worship videos. This way I get some vacation time without interrupting Holy Cross's schedule. My weeks will run from Wednesday to Wednesday. So this coming Wednesday, July the 8th, I will begin a week of vacation and I will return to work on Wednesday, July the 15th. Um, while I'm away, um, in my backyard mostly, relaxing, you can leave a message on the church phone, which will be checked daily, and someone will get back to you. Um, our care team, a big thank you to our care team, uh, which continues to make regular contact with our members and friends. So if you need help, call the church, leave a message, and someone will get back to you. Remember to stay safe and that this summer, wearing a mask is what love looks like in public. Go in peace, be love in the world. Thanks be to all that is holy. We hope that you have found this broadcast to be of value to you at this time. To continue to offer these, we depend on the support of donors. If you wish to help to keep us going, please donate what feels right for you via Canada Helps to Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Newmarket. Peace be with you.